Okay, that was so fetch. <laughs> Unless you've lived under a rock for the past two decades, you have probably seen Mean Girls or at least have heard about Mean Girls just about everywhere. The movie came out in 2004 during the height of Lindsay Lohan's career and the rise of the amazing Rachel McAdams. The movie was written by comedian actress Tina Fey and became an embedded part of pop culture with all its iconic lines used in the movie. Later in 2011, the sequel of the movie was released and let me put it this way, the movie shouldn't have been made at all. When you hear that the movie was filmed in 22 days, it makes so much sense how it turned out in terms of screen performance and that wasn't even the worst part. The plot nearly has no redemption and honestly rewatching it to make this video was not far from torture. Okay, I'm kidding. There are worse things. But in this video, we are going to look at what made Mean Girls 2 such an epic fail of a sequel by looking at both films and looking at what went wrong. And spoiler alert, a lot of things did. Katie's big day. I guess it's natural for parents to cry on their kid's first day of school. But, you know, this usually happens when the kid is five. I'm 16, and until today, I was homeschooled. In the original film, we begin with 16-year-old homeschool girl Katie Heron and her zoologist parents who have returned to the United States after 12 years of research trip in Africa, settling in Evanston, Illinois. On her first day of attending a public school, North Shore High School, she meets and befriends Janice Ian and Damian Lay. They educate Katie on the school's various cliques and warn her to avoid the most popular and infamous one, the plastic, which is led by Queen Bee Regina George and her sidekicks, insecure but rich Gretchen Wieners and sweet but dim-witted Karen Smith. We're doing a lunchtime survey of new students. Can you answer a few questions? Okay. Is your muffin buttered? <laughs> what? The Plastics take an interest in Katie after defending her against a sexist classmate and invite her to sit with them at lunch. After learning of the invite, Janice asks Katie to befriend them and tell her everything that they say. The following day, Katie goes undercover with the Plastics and they lay down the rules for what Katie refers to as girl work. You can only wear your hair in a ponytail once a week. So I guess you pick today. Oh, and we only wear jeans or track pants on Fridays. Now, if you break any of these rules, you can't sit with us at lunch. Well, I mean, not just you, like, any of us. She becomes attracted to Aaron Samuels and tells Gretchen that she thinks Aaron Samuel is cute. And it just so happens that he's Regina's ex, and Gretchen explains that he's off limits. After school, Katie and the Plastic end up at Regina's house where the Plastic show Katie their burn book, a homemade book that includes an insulting and or degrading page to each girl in their class. Katie reports back to Janice Ian with the news of the burn book. Hello? I know your secret. Oh god, busted. Just start apologizing and crying. No, play it cool. Secret? What are you saying about? Gretchen told me that you like Aaron Samuels. I mean, I don't care. Do whatever you want. But let me just tell you something about Aaron. All he cares about is school and his mom and his friends. Later, Regina finds out about Katie's crush on Aaron and jealously steals him back at a Halloween party by kissing him in front of Katie. This spurs Katie to fully commit to Janice's plan to cut off Regina's resources involving breaking Regina up with Aaron, tricking Regina into eating Swedish nutritious bars that actually make her gain weight instead of losing weight, and turning Regina's fellow plastics against her. In the process, Katie unwittingly remakes herself in Regina's image, becoming spiteful and superficial and abandons Janice and Damien and in the ensuing weeks Katie starts failing her calculus assignments on purpose so Aaron will tutor her. At their first session they kiss and it looks like Katie's plan worked. When Aaron quickly reconsiders out of respect for Regina Katie blurts out that Regina's cheating on him. So what are we doing this weekend? Yeah what are we doing? Oh I have to go to Madison with my parents. What? We have tickets for this thing. What? 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 Was I the new queen bee? I can try and get out of it. Yeah. Everything becomes out of control when Katie lies to her parents and friends in order to throw a party. Regina comes to the party that she wasn't invited to, only to walk in on Katie and Aaron. After this, we see a major showdown between Janice and Katie, during which Janice tells Katie that she is not pretending to be a plastic anymore and that she has, in fact, become plastic. Why are you eating a Caltein bar? I'm starving. Man, I hate those things. Coach Carr makes us eat those when we want to move up a weight class. What? 
to make you gain weight like crazy. Mother! When Regina is finally made aware of Katie's treachery, she retaliates by spreading the contents of the burn book all over the school, quickly inciting a socially motivated brawl throughout the hall. To avoid suspicion, Regina inserts a fake label of herself in the book in order to blame Katie, Gretchen, and Karen, the only female girls not mentioned in the book. Regina throws photocopies of the book pages all over the hallway. As soon as class is dismissed and her classmates see the pages, they go crazy and literally start fighting each other in the hallway like jungle animals. Mr. Duvall orders all junior girls to the gym and Miss Norbury runs an impromptu mandatory workshop that basically boils down to how to not talk about people behind their back. During this workshop, Miss Norbury, whom the burn book defamed as a drug dealer, makes the girl face the ways that they treat each other and apologize to each other and the teachers and the plan sees success as friendships are rekindled. I have this friend who is a new student this year and I convinced her that it would be fun to mess up Regina George's life. So I had her pretend to be friends with Regina and then she would come to my house after and we would just laugh about all the dumb stuff Regina said. And uh, we gave her these candy bar things that would make her gain weight. <laughs> and we turned her best friends against her. And then, uh, oh yeah, Katie, you know my friend Katie, she, uh, she made out with Regina's boyfriend and then convinced him to break up with her. Oh God, and we, we gave you foot cream instead of face wash. And, oh God. I am so sorry, Regina. Really, I, I don't know why I did it. I guess it's probably because I've got a big lesbian crush on you. Suck on that! When it's Janice's turn, she tells the entire group about her and Katie's plan to ruin Regina's life, and Regina storms out. Katie follows. And in the street in front of the whole school, Regina lays the verbal smackdown on Katie and promptly gets hit by a bus. Shunned by her peers and grounded by her parents, Katie takes full blame for the burn book. After making amends with Regina, she joins the mathletes in a state championship final to make up for her math test that she failed. Katie answers the tiebreaker correctly and they win the championship for the school. At the spring fling dance, Katie is elected queen. On stage, Katie declares that all her classmates are wonderful in their own way, snaps her tiara, and distributes the pieces to other girls in the crowd. She then reconciles with Janice, Damien, and Aaron and reaches a truce with the plastics. The plastics disband over the summer vacation. Regina joins the lacrosse team to deal with her anger. Karen becomes the school's weather reporter, and Gretchen Wiener joins the cool Asian clique. Aaron graduates from high school and attends North Shore University while starting a long-distance relationship with Katie, who visits him during the weekends. Janice begins dating Matthew Kevin, whom she initially disliked. As Katie reflects on the junior socialite piece that has taken over the North Shore High, a group of new junior plastics has arisen, and Katie imagines them hitting by a bus like Regina was, but it's not real. Now let's look at the main themes that were discussed in the original movie. The first one being femininity. At the start of the film, Katie is introduced to us as a blank canvas that has been shielded from the real world. Mean Girl uses the plastics as a way to show how much more complicated it is to be a woman in modern society. In the scene where the plastics are standing in front of the mirror in Regina's room, they are dissecting every part of their body and we the audience through Katie's narration understand how insane that must look to an outsider but it is insanely accurate how often that happens with people in general and not just the fictional characters in this movie god my hips are huge oh please i hate my calves at least you guys can wear halters i've got man shoulders i used to think there was just fat and skinny apparently there's a lot of things that can be wrong on your body my hairline is so weird my pores are huge my nail beds suck I have really bad breath in the morning. Ew. We also have the burn book, which is a physical manifestation on the backstabbing that happens all the time but gets swept under the rug and ignored until things pile up and gets out of control like it did when Regina exposed the contents of the burn book. So you don't think anyone will vote for her? Katie, she's not pretty. I mean, that sounds bad, but whatever. The Spring Fling Queen is always pretty. I mean, the crazy thing is, is that it should be Karen, but people forget about her because she's such a slut. 
Throughout the movie, we see on multiple occasions that the girls constantly call each other sluts and whores and basically slut shame each other all the time. During the assembly, Miss Norbury pointed this out by telling them that they're only making it okay for guys to call them that. Katie points this out at the end of the film and acknowledges how much more damage it does than anything else and how counter-reproductive it actually is. I hope you do join Mathletes, you know, because uh, we start in a couple weeks and I would love to have a girl on the team just, you know, so the team could meet a girl. I think I'm going to do it. Great. You can't join Mathletes, it's social suicide. Thanks, Jamie. Another theme that was very much discussed in the movie was intelligence. In Katie's case, right off the bat, we are informed that she's very smart and that she loves math. Her teacher, Ms. Norbury, notices it and pretty quickly tries to scout her to join the math leads. On several occasions, her peers tell her that it is social suicide to do that. And being smart isn't cool and it is literally what society tries to do with women all the time. She starts to dumb herself down and fail her schoolwork in order to get boys' attention. She starts to focus more on looking pretty because that's what she's taught by her peers when she arrives at North Shore High, which proved to be completely false because her looks wasn't even what Aaron Samuel liked about her in the first place. He was, in, he was interested in her way before she became Regina 2.0, but obviously Kaylee couldn't help becoming that person when that is all she heard from both sides, from the cool kids and even the underdogs like Janice and Damien. Because being with the plastics was like being famous. People looked at you all the time and everybody just knew stuff about you. That new girl moved here from Africa. I saw Katie Heron wearing army pants and flip flops, so I bought army pants and flip flops. That Katie girl is hot. She might even be hotter than Regina George. I hear Regina George is dating Aaron Samuels again. The two were seen canoodling at Chris Iso's Halloween party. and They've been inseparable ever since. Another theme that was maybe not up front was politics, but it was there. The movie used high school popularity as a layout to highlight the social dynamics in politics. The plastics are at the top of the food chain, and even when people talk about the plastics, you see how people worship and only have good things to say about them. Behind the scenes, though, we see how cruel they are and that they're not even loyal between themselves and that everyone just uses each other at their own advantage. Regina is literally a dictator who knows how to control people just by how she approaches them in a conversation. Regina isn't just the queen because people think that she's the prettiest because her sidekicks are beautiful as well. Regina is a manipulator who knows how to build you and break you when she needs to. When she spots Katie to be a potential threat when she sees Jason approach her, Regina acts so quickly by inviting Katie to sit with her and the plastics in order to get her on her side and tame the threat she poses to her and the plastics. Regina shows us from the beginning that she can take down anyone even if it means hurting multiple people in the process. We see this when she calls Jason's girlfriend's mom and when she reveals the contents of the burn book. Another instance, Katie says that even though she doesn't like Regina, you want to be liked by her. And that's the perfect description of politicians and how politics work. There's nothing genuine in what they do and why they do it. The motive is to reach the end goal and in Katie's case, it was reaching the definition of popularity in this new world that she entered. I mean, you can literally compare this movie with the Julius Caesar play and see how much they mirror each other, which I might actually do a separate video on because there's actually a lot to deconstruct on that side. Now, I only address the main themes explored in this movie, but Mean Girls actually has a lot more themes that can be explored and analyzed. If you love Mean Girls as much as I do, I suggest you do more research about the symbolism because it will make it that much more fun on your next watch to pick up on all those extra details. The sequel starts similarly to the first one. Jo is telling us her life story, and through this we find out that she moved her whole life because of her father's job and that her mom passed away when she was young. Oh, and that she's not like other girls. She's an 18-year-old senior when she arrives in Ohio and attends North Shore High School with hopes of making it to Carnegie Mellon University, her late mother's alma mater. On her first day, she captures the attention of the clique called The Plastic, composed of Mandy Weatherly, the self-proclaimed leader, Chastity Mayer, the airhead who will just about jump anything that is willing, if you know what I mean, and high-maintenance sidekick Hope Plotkin. Do you see a pattern here? Joe meets Abby Hanover, whom Mandy perceives as a rival, and later we witness a cringy scene in the cafeteria where Mandy basically bans Abby from breathing the same air as her because she fed her dog. I'm sorry, I, I didn't know. I'm really sorry, Mandy. I I'll buy you another 
hers. Or you can just have mine. Is that what I think it is? Uh-uh. Duck. I love ducks. It's, uh, the Prada Fringe purse. My dad got it for me last month, but I told last him... Last month? Ugh, just go. <sighs> oh! Oh! Stay down there and don't ever look at me again. Better yet, don't even breathe the same air. Joe's father is a mechanic who rebuilds engines for NASCAR and she as well becomes quite good of a mechanic herself and ends up taking an advanced shop class where she meets Tyler. Later in the story, Abby is still being bullied by her peers led by a jealous Mandy. After Joe gives Abby a ride home, she meets Abby's father, a successful infomercial entrepreneur who offers to pay Joe's college tuition in exchange for her maintaining good friends with Abby. Joe reluctantly accepts, motivated by her desire to attend Carnegie Mellon. Joe, Tyler, and Abby become close friends and Mandy starts to see Joe as a threat over time and wants to recruit her as a plastic in order to control her. But when Joe rejects their offer, Mandy sets off to destroy Joe. Throughout the story, Mandy escalated her war pranks which included using artificial sweetener and coffee to ruin the engine that was being repaired by Joe's father and this triggers Joe to go full mean girls on her side and decides to start a real plastic war. And the war begins and we get scenes like this. Joe ends up running against Mandy for homecoming court and their reign threatens Tyler and Joe's relationship. At some point, the drama with the plastics, Joe tries to give back the money to Sydney Hanover and of course, Mandy overhears their conversation while going for a run and uses this information against her. This leads us to the moment where Joe is supposed to realize that she has become like Mandy, if not even worse, and leads Tyler and the anti-plastics to go against her. To put the nail in the coffin, Mandy and Nick steal the homecoming court charity money, which is raised to be donated to an animal research group. Mandy plants the money in Joe's shed, then gives an anonymous note to Principal Duval stating that the money is there. Thanks to an unwitting betrayal by Quinn, Joe is expelled, but not before she finds Mandy and challenges her to a game of flag football. Mandy refuses until she realizes that she needs to win to remain popular and reluctantly agrees. A few days later, Joe's friends come around and decide to forgive her. Tyler and the other anti-plastics try to help Joe prove her innocence with the help of the school's tech guy, Elliot. They do this by hacking into the security camera of their neighbor to get the footage of Mandy and Nick. Right near the end of the film, we have a flag football, and this is how it went. After the anti-plastics beat the plastics at flag football, Mandy and Nick are arrested after the images of them planting the money in Joe's home are found by Elliot texting it to all the cell phones in the audience. Principal Duval apologizes to Joe for the mix-up. At the school's homecoming dance, Abby and Elliot are elected king and queen thanks to Joe dropping out of the competition. And yeah, that's what happens. The film ends when Joe and Abby decide to attend Carnegie Mellon University together while Tyler attends Penn State University, which is a short drive from Carnegie Mellon. And Quinn, assuming the position she has long coveted, the leader of the plastics. Although Mandy and Nick both get community service and were allowed to graduate, thanks in part to their parents donating a new library for the school, they lost their popularity and for cruel actions, earning Mandy a bad reputation. Chastity learns the meaning of her new name and Hope begins working on overcoming her fear of germs. Okay, I think I'm stating the obvious here, <laughs> but this movie was a menial attempt to recapture the magic of the first one, but clearly failed miserably. I mean, from the get when watching this movie, you already can tell that they took the formula of the first movie and tried to change maybe two details and thought it would work, but here's why it didn't. The writers of the sequel completely missed the point of what the first movie gave us, which was beyond the whole high school teen drama. 
Mean Girls essentially used a high school as a background to highlight other characteristics in society and politics and just things in the real world in general. They must have picked from direct stereotypes and decided to create a story around them because pretty much every character is literally a heightened version of a stereotype. Let's look at Chastity first. I mean, whoever came up with her name and character probably thought they did something so smart and hilarious by making her the complete opposite of what her name means. But basically, they followed the anything that moves trope, which basically says the character has remarkably broad standards. They may have species and gender boundaries, but that's about it. Things like age, personality, attractiveness restrict them much less than the average person, such a character may get around a lot but not necessarily and sometimes it's just that their standards are broad or low so basically they took this trope and multiplied it by a hundred she literally gets sent to the principal's office for getting caught making out in five different spots and then proceeds to try to make out with two more guys in the principal's office it is so tacky that they would go that far with her character just to prove a point. In the original Mean Girls, Karen is an airhead that also has a reputation of getting around a lot, but they didn't try to make it a point by showing her macking on with literally every guy on the screen. This could have been somewhat salvaged if they had done a better effort with the main character, Joe. She is actually the most planned character of the film, and Megan Martin's acting only made things worse. I mean, Megan was so monotone and most of the time she sounded like she was reading from a script and didn't really know where the scene was going yet. She's supposed to be the embodiment of I am the cool chick, I'm not like other girls, I don't like drama and I'm beyond all the pettiness. And I'm sure you've heard of showing and not telling, well that's the opposite of what was done here. All they kept doing is having other characters call her badass and compare her to other girls. In fact, Joe takes part in this multiple times by suddenly telling us that she avoids girls because she's not like them. Obviously, they didn't get the point of what made Katie special. Like I said earlier, Katie Heron was like a blank canvas. As she was taking in all the information in the movie, we were getting insights with her. It almost felt like a hilariously narrated documentary. Joe, on the other hand, already had opinion about girls. She's not teaching us anything, she's just giving us her insight and her opinions about how girls are. All she's trying to do is tell us that she's different from girls and that she's not down for the drama. So, Abby Hanover played by Jennifer Stone was so sweet but honestly why make her an artist like Janice Ian? They could have just given her something else to be passionate about. It would have not changed anything about her character but I guess that was the easiest way to go and honestly they were just setting her up to fail by doing that. Now regarding Mandy, I'll give credit where credit is due. Mayara Wash did portray a typical ruthless queen bee really well but that is all her character gave us, unlike the complexity of Regina George's character, which it isn't her fault because she didn't write the character, so I'm sure she gave it the best she could. A good example of the main difference is how Mandy approached Joe versus how Regina approached Katie. Take a look at the difference between the next two scenes. My what? Is he bothering you? Jason, why are you such a skis? I'm just being friendly. <sighs> you were supposed to call me last night. Jason. You do not come to a party at my house with Gretchen and then scam on some poor innocent girl right in front of us three days later. She's not interested. Do you want to have sex with him? No, thank you. Good. So it's settled. So you can go shave your back now. Bye, Jason. Bitch. Wait. Sit down. Seriously, sit down. Why don't I know you? I'm new. I, I'm Mandy with an I. And you're Joe, right? That's me. So Joe, since you're new here, I thought we'd help you out. Let you know who to hang out with. Us. The real welcoming committee had arrived. And who not to? Did I say welcoming? Uh, oh, wow. Thanks. But I think I can figure that out on my own. Really? Well, I, I haven't been impressed so far. Excuse me? But I'm a benevolent dictator, so why don't we discuss over a non-fat, no-sugar raspberry frappuccino coffee joint? We only use skinny and sweet. It's like cellulite in a strap without the cellulite. As scientifically interesting as that sounds, I'll have to pass. 
Oh, it wasn't a question. <laughs> Oops. Guess I answered anyway. We all know that they're both terrible, but seriously, whose proposition would you have accepted? Regina George is an interesting character to dissect because calling her just a mean girl is only hitting the surface. She isn't just one-dimensional. Mandy, however, you can tell is just spoiled and mean. I mean, you, you just can't put these characters side by side with the original movie because it's just useless. I'm not even going to try to compare Aaron Samuels with Tyler or Hope with Gretchen Wieners. Not one character can compare to the ones in the first movie. I mean, not even Mr. Duvall in the first movie can be compared to Mr. Duvall in the second movie. Honestly, this movie belonged on Disney Channel, which is funny because the majority of the characters in the movie were Disney stars. Take out the swearing and the mocking of Joe's virginity and I promise you this movie would have done really well with preteens who watch Disney Channel. Oh yeah, and if they maybe didn't try to attach themselves to the original movie, it wouldn't have rubbed so many people off the wrong way. They got their target audience completely wrong because if it had a G rating and a different name, it would have been a hit with the tweens and maybe it would have it wouldn't have gotten such a bad reputation. But you know, that's just what I think. Honestly, for me, I'm not even sure that Mean Girls could have fixed their problem with anything that was on the screen, unless they had completely scrapped that story, written a new one, or changed their target audience, or just they shouldn't have called themselves the Mean Girls too. By following such an iconic movie, you have to bring it, and they couldn't, you know. It was a low-budget film, and the actors were, you know, I, I don't know. But listen, I think that this movie just could have been okay if it wasn't a sequel to Mean Girls 2. I mean, movies copy each other all the time, so it wouldn't be the first time you'd see a movie be like, that's literally the plot of that. They just shouldn't have called the movie Mean Girls 2. But I hope in this video I was able to explain to you guys some of the things that set up Mean Girls 2 to fail as a sequel of such an iconic movie like Mean Girls. And I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, please make sure to leave a thumbs up. If you have any topics, movies, series, anything that you want me to discuss, you could leave a comment down below and I might feature that in my next video. Please subscribe and like.